For years, I've been hoping to say one sentence. Half-Life finally got meta. It's difficult to imagine a world that wasn't changed by Gordon Freeman and his crowbar. Sure, Gordon wasn't really a character at all, and most of us hardly ever used the crowbar in his games, but that face, those glasses, that armor, and that crowbar are about as iconic as anything else in gaming. There's a legacy behind Gordon and the Half-Life series that nearly all of gaming has been affected by. Half-Life 3 confirmed. Whether you game or not, if you frequent the internet enough to be watching this video, you've heard this phrase before. This all stems from that infamous cliffhanger ending we got to Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Eli Vance dies, the Borealis is being targeted by the Resistance and the Combine alike, and the G-Man is finally starting to get more hands-on in our story, revealing his intentions a little bit more with each word and action. We've been waiting to see how this story ends for nearly 13 years. However, at one point, we got a bit of closure to the story, and this is why Half-Life has been in such an awkward position all this time. Epistle 3 on August 25th, 2017, Mark Laidlaw, the writer for Half-Life 2, released a letter from the perspective of Gertie Fremont, a copyright-safe stand-in for Gordon Freeman, which recounted the events of the fabled Half-Life 2 Episode 3. We finally knew how the story was originally intended to end, and as gratifying as that was, and as perfect an ending to the story as Epistle 3 was, it meant that Valve couldn't exactly make that game anymore. We all figured that Valve was done with the series, and that this was the only closure we'd ever get, Valve couldn't make another Gordon Freeman game, because they couldn't skip the events of Epistle 3, but they couldn't just transcribe them to a game, either. The series, like Gordon, had been put in stasis. Maybe someday, the world both in and out of the fiction of this game would need Gordon to save us again, but he was indisposed. His story had been stolen from him, and so we'd never get to see our savior again. I'm hyping up Gordon a lot here, why is that? It's because Gordon, or more accurately, the Half-Life series, once stayed the inevitable decline of love, respect, and passion in the world of big-budget game development. After Gordon Freeman came along in Half-Life 2, game developers started getting incredibly creative incredibly quickly. Between Bioshock, Prey 06, Time Shift, The Resistance series, Singularity, and many more, games were being made with so much love and passion. It was the polar opposite of the gaming landscape as it is today. In more ways than one, in both fiction and reality, Half-Life 2 was about starting a revolution. Amongst PC gamers, we literally tell the stories of Gordon Freeman as if he was some sort of mythic figure. Most of us have spent hours talking about the intentions of the Combine, the specifics of their takeover, the G-Man's intentions, the possible fates of the Borealis, whether or not Breen was truly a bad guy or truly dead, where the Vortigaunt stand, or whether or not mankind is totally doomed. While the actual influence Half-Life 2 had is now only an echo in the world of gaming, the legacy it carried lives on, and with how things have been lately in the world of gaming, with VR being a slow, painfully slow-growing market, modern game design being incredibly stale, with only the occasional Death Stranding, Prey, or Resident Evil 7 to take us away from the monotony of space marines and mercenaries, the time had come when we needed Gordon Freeman again. We needed another revolution in the world of game design. Again though, Gordon was indisposed. You can't make another Gordon Freeman game because of Epistle 3. All you can do is try your best to live up to that legacy. Well, as Half-Life Alex showed us, it wasn't Gordon Freeman that made the Half-Life games so great. It was the love, the passion, and the respect for your medium. Half-Life's legendary status has only gotten more and more illustrious due to the time we've had to wait since the last game. And so, not far into this game, we see this huge mural dedicated to the work of Dr. Freeman, and the events of Half-Life 1. Alex has some big shoes to fill if she and her game are going to live up to the legacy of Gordon and his games. Well, we do some typical Half-Life stuff for a while. We revolt against the Combine, we save Eli Vance, we fight zombies and headcrabs in dank, disgusting environments, and that's when it's revealed what's in this vault we've been trying to break into for this entire game. Gordon Freeman. Five years from now, when Half-Life 2 takes place, Gordon would start a revolution, practically single-handedly, dealing a massive blow to the Combine and giving the human race time to repopulate and prepare for the Combine's retaliation. If Alex could free Gordon from this vault now, then he could kickstart that revolution so much earlier. Maybe Gordon was taken from the G-Man by the Combine, and thus cracking the vault would give G-Man a chance to recover Gordon and put him back in stasis. Regardless of all of that though, Alex's goal over the course of this game is to simply hunt down the Freeman. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. But that really is what's going on here. 
From the moment we learn that Gordon is the super weapon that the Combine is storing in the vault, we hear tons of dialogue about how he's so much better than us, and how he's going to save the world, and even outright lies, like that he made it through Black Mesa using only his crowbar. Rest. What's the deal with the crowbar? Oh, you mean Gordon Freeman's crowbar? Yeah. Oh, Alex. He fought his way out of Black Mesa with nothing but that crowbar. No way. It's true. Well, it's true that that's what they say. You know, nobody knows for sure. Even over the course of this game, we fight way less enemies than Gordon had to fight in Half-Life 2, simply because the Resistance hasn't really formed yet and the Combine are unprepared, especially in the quarantine zone. Alex is constantly being shown as less powerful than Gordon, and from a meta perspective, this means that the game is being shown as less powerful than Half-Life 3 would have been. It's not until we finally crack the vault that we hear any dialogue comparing us to Freeman in an admirable light. Here we go. Time to go rescue the savior of humanity. You know, honey, you haven't been doing too bad yourself. Earth could have used you in the Seven Hour War. May you get a glass of eight. When we actually make it into the vault, the Gordon Freeman hype train only gets more and more ludicrous. We have a surreal, hallucinogenic sequence which alludes to a split timeline with these mirrored rooms, and at this point we're starting to suspect that Gordon isn't the one in the vault, but that it's G-Man, and we're starting to feel some of his power. However, from a narrative perspective, Alex still thinks it's Gordon she's going after, so we'll roll with that. We see this huge chamber with a locked core in the center, and immediately all I could think is that Gordon quite literally has his own fortress of solitude, a la Superman. Frankly, this all seems absolutely ridiculous if you still think that the Combine are doing all of this to contain one perfectly normal theoretical physicist. Alex's gravity gloves then take on the ability to redirect these energy spheres, in a sequence similar to when Gordon's gravity gun is supercharged, only I think it's impossible to deny that in this moment the game is painting her as more powerful than we've ever seen Gordon. She started out as a naive young girl who was afraid of the dark and who was second priority to saving Eli. Now she's an unstoppable badass who understands exactly what her world is capable of. Well, now we can get to the moment that you've all been waiting for, an analysis on the different layers of meaning to the G-Man sequence. My interest here isn't in the literal, so I'll just skim over that. G-Man says that Gordon is unable to perform the tasks laid before him, that is to say, he's protected from G-Man's influence by the Vortigaunts, so G-Man takes on Alex by tempting her with his ability to change her father's fate and save his life. Alex takes the deal, and as a consequence of this, Half-Life 2 Episode 2's ending has changed. Eli is alive, and Alex is abducted by the G-Man. Epistle 3 can no longer be canon in this new timeline. Eli would never have let Gordon use the Borealis against the Combine. So now onto the really interesting stuff. It's where this game's entire angle on how exactly you can make a Half-Life game without continuing the story of Half-Life 2 comes to a head. Half-Life games need to spark a revolution, and they need to change the face of the gaming industry. Gordon Freeman isn't a requirement to do that. Anyone can, as long as the game they're in is made with love and passion. We hear all these legends about Gordon Freeman over the course of the game, but in the end, G-Man simply describes him as unable or unwilling to do what was planned. In the Half-Life 2 episodes, G-Man was utterly thwarted by the Vortigaunts, and in a manner of speaking, the director of the games was thwarted alongside him. The Vorts stopped the story from proceeding as intended, and they led Gordon to the Episode 2 ending, which led to Epistle 3 ending Gordon's story before Valve could. G-Man, or to call him by another name, Valve, can't use Gordon the way he was intended, so he uses Alex to correct that mistake. With the ending to Episode 2 changed so drastically, Epistle 3 can no longer be canon. Epistle 3 put Gordon into stasis, and so Valve, G-Man, used Alex to destroy Epistle 3 and get its hands back on Gordon so that the series can continue from where it left off. This whole game was just Valve's way of sidestepping the awkward situation the story of Half-Life 2 was left in, and now that it's done that, we no longer know what's going to happen next like we have since Epistle 3. Gordon is back. He's a valuable asset, sure, but as I described in my previous video on Half-Life Alex, Gordon isn't necessary for Half-Life to completely define a new genre of game. Gordon won't get to define the future of VR action games, and he won't get to revive the entire series. That was Alex's job. Gordon's job now is to finish this fight against the Combine. With this, Half-Life can finally join the ranks of Bioshock, Metal Gear Solid, Undertale, The Stanley Parable, Prey, Planescape Torment, and similar highbrow games as a series that wants you to think about it in terms that go beyond the base level narrative. Half-Life has finally gotten meta. The series had been in an incredibly awkward position since 2017. You simply couldn't make a sequel without annoying the core audience, either because you stuck to the script of Epistle 3, or because you changed it. 
Well, now that that's changed, we can remark on what Gordon Freeman is, and what he means to Half-Life. We all love his story, and we all want to see how it ends, but to get to the heart of what Half-Life truly is, a medium for gaming revolutions, you need to go deeper than Freeman. Any character can do it, but the developers of that character's game have to love the game they're making. They need to be endlessly passionate about it. They need to plan everything out carefully, and they need to break new boundaries. Forget about Freeman. If you think that Freeman is what it takes to change the face of gaming, then you need to think larger than that. It isn't Freeman that starts the revolution, it's the passion and commitment of a few talented people who really care about what they're working on. It isn't truly Freeman we've been missing since 2007. It's the passion, the dedication, the inspiration, and the love it takes to truly evolve the medium.